the Sustainability Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. Thank you everyone. Uh, I'm glad uh, to see a good turnout um, and, and interest in, in my little grant program. But, uh, but I hope I'll do it justice and, uh, and maybe everybody here will learn something today uh, from my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar. Is anything else? Yeah. Okay, I'll just make sure. You never called me by my last name, but I hope you did. But I just, I'm trying to, we're in a professional setting, I just figured I would exactly. keep it professional. So, but thank you, did. So, okay. So, um, Jay Springer, like, like uh, uh, Dick said, I, I've, I've been with DEP for 28 years. Uh, I started out in uh, wastewater finance, uh, then I moved to land use regulation. I did a lot of uh, permits for uh, uh, a lot of development in the 90s, uh, specializing in wetlands and wetland delineations, but I also did some flood hazard uh, projects and some coastal uh, development projects. And I've spent most of my last uh, 15 years at DUP <coughs> doing a lot of the damage I did back in the 90s by permitting a lot of those things. So, uh, uh, I once had a, a, a fellow who uh, worked for the Army Corps of Engineers uh, at a cocktail party and someone said, well, it must be really a great uh, a great job to protect the environment. He says, well, I don't really protect it. I regulate its destruction. So, so <laughs> and, and it's, it's kind of a, you know, coming, me coming full circle and, and trying to complete my career as I, as I wind down my, my state career is to trying to undo some of the things that we thought we were doing right. But, um, and you'll see some examples of this in my presentation. Mr. Springer? Yes. Uh, I may have to ask you to speak a little louder for the recording. Okay. Thank I'll you. try. <laughs> I have one of those voices that it just, you know, kind of monotone and it's hard to pick up. So I'll try and speak a little, a little more loudly. So, okay. So, uh, 1972 Clean Water Act passed by Congress. Uh, what was it? The Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught on fire that they said we have to do something about this. Uh, so they passed the Clean Water Act, and they focused mostly on uh, point sources of, of pollution, uh, discharges from uh, industrial facilities, to wastewater treatment facilities. A lot of money is poured into, and I'll get into my first part of my career at DEJ, a lot of money is poured into uh, writing these uh, uh, 201, Section 201 of the Clean Water Act facilities plans and Section 208 of the Clean Water Act to uh, to develop um, uh, uh, water quality management plans, regional and area-wide water quality management plans. Billions of dollars are poured into a lot of municipal facilities uh, through a grant program that eventually became a, a state revolving fund program, which is now the SRF program at DEP, uh, focusing on, on regionalizing a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, of, of uh, sanitary sewer systems, big, you know, State Valley, Sewage Authority, Ocean County, Atlanta County, Camden County, um, really ignoring uh, non-point source pollution. So in, uh, in the 1987 reauthorization of the Clean Water Act, they added Section 319. Section 319 was to, to address uh, non-point source portions, sources of pollution. Um, the primary goal of the funding program uh, is to address uh, 
water quality use impairments on the state's 303D list. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say 303D list? I see one hand, two hands. Okay. So, um, as part of the Clean Water Act, um, states every two years have to report, you know, states set their own uh, uh, surface water quality standards. And then every two years they have to report out to the federal government uh, how we're doing. If, if our, our things, our, our, our water bodies now in New Jersey, we used to do it by stream segment, but now we, uh, we do it by uh, uh, hydrologic unit code 14. Folks know what I'm talking about, but basically it's a smaller scale watershed, and we, we address those those HOC 14 HOCs, those HOC 14s, and, and what what they're impaired for. There is not a HOC 14 in the state of New Jersey that's not impaired for something, and mostly it's beautiful coliform or phosphorus or nitrogen or total suspended solids. But there's also metals impairments and mercury and fish tissue and lead and other stuff too. So uh, every one of the there's 462 up 14s in this thing. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but um, but uh, I used to have a map in this presentation. I took it out for today, but now I wish I had it. But um, so uh, so the reason for this funding is to address those um, impairments on the 303D list and to try and get those water bodies delisted for those impairments. Um, EPA mandates that half of this money. Um, let me go back. Uh, about $165 million is made available each year. Somewhere, it, it fluctuates because it's, it's, you know, it's appropriation by Congress, but uh, anywhere between $155 million to $168 million in the last few years has been appropriated by Congress to the states, to the territories, and to the tribes in the U.S. Uh, of $319. And, and New Jersey's a lot of usually averages around $2.5 million a year. Half of that money has to be used uh, to implement a, a TMDL, uh, total maximum daily load, uh, or uh, to uh, address uh, projects identified and approved watershed-based plans. And every once in a while, uh, EPA will uh, uh, reprogram some money and give us additional money for discretionary projects, usually things that they want to see uh, done uh, in, in things like living shorelines or, or projects in environmental justice communities. Okay, so the types of projects we usually fund, uh, development of watershed-based plans, uh, implementation of projects identified in those plans, uh, projects that help meet non-point source maximum daily load, or TMDLs, uh, green infrastructure projects in CSO communities, um, and, and a whole list of an environmental education initiatives and outreach types uh, projects for those types of things that I just described. Typical watershed-based plan, uh, it, it you know, includes a, a watershed characterization, um, priority measures to implement, um, prioritized list of implementation measures, cost estimates and, of, of those implementation measures, uh, the estimated load reductions that are nece necessary to achieve the designated water quality standard for that water body, um, and really uh, the focus of these watershed plans is to integrate uh, Working, you're taking the watershed approach and working with local partners and groups uh, and getting their participation in uh, writing these plans. Because these plans, without the local partners and leveraging resources, not only the dollars we have, but with other resources, a lot of these things, a lot of these measures will not get accomplished. Okay. Things we typically do, and, and Dibs and I were talking about this a little bit earlier before um, when I first got here. Uh, the measures we, biofiltration basins, rain gardens, things like that. Uh, retrofitting of, of stormwater basins, that's a big one. It's usually pretty cheap to do um, and, and, and usually uh, very effective. Uh, and other types of green infrastructure, stream bank restoration activities, including living shorelines and tidal areas. They can, those projects can get expensive. Uh, they usually require a lot of permits. So we try and steer away from, you know, really in the, in the stream uh, type work, just because the permitting involved uh, can get up, can, <coughs> the cost can get quite high. Um, and then, uh, again, targeted educations for specific impairments, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, or total suspended solids, or pathogens. 
Okay, here's an example of a project that, uh, that this is, this is uh, in Trenton. It was the former location of Magic Marker, you know, Magic Marker, you know, mm -hmm. except the Magic Marker. So <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, they had a site there. It was contaminated. Um, uh, years ago, the uh, Petty's Run, which was, uh, which is a stream corridor, the a, a little tiny stream that ran through Trenton. Part of it was piped. Part of it went through this, through this site. So they. Um, and they wanted to go in, they wanted to, and this is when I talk about leveraging other resources. Um, they wanted to go and clean up the site using some of our brownfield and site remediation funding. Um, but they also wanted to restore Petty's Run, um, you know, restore the stream corridor through the town, so right through, through that area. So this is the site. I mean, they did some, uh, did some housing nearby. Um, you, know, the, the, you can look through the different slides here, but. Um, Contaminated soil, and then um, trying to restore the stream corridor. Again, taking out the old contaminated fill, bringing in clean fill, uh, trying to recreate, uh, you know, a, a stream, uh, you know, pool ripple meanders, that kind of stuff. But it's not not a straight line uh, type of thing. Yeah, like, uh, what do they do with uh, all the excavated stuff? Like, uh, well, that has to be taken to a hauled off site in landfill. Okay. So, so uh, the grant pays for that? No, so this is this is an example, and I I wasn't directly involved with this one, but this is an example of the type of projects where we try and match up three nineteen dollars and leverage those resources with other funding okay. sources, all right. because you know, two and a half million dollars for the entire state of New Jersey. I mean, that's that's yeah, not a lot of money. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we try and match up our projects with other good projects that are going on. Um, part of the, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, part of the, uh, there's a, a change going on in my program where um, we're, we're starting to kind of break out of our silos uh, and work with other programs in DEP and trying to match up. We've, I've got some examples of this here too. But um, there's there's some other funding sources being made available, and we're reprogramming other funds to help enhance our, our 319 dollars for, for for projects a lot like this one. So um, so anyway, so contaminated soil dug up, hauled off site, clean fill brought in, restore uh, or, or create and restore a natural stream corridor. Again, try and use. Um, Minimal, you know, try and protect the existing vegetation as much as possible. Bring in uh, more soft type of uh, techniques, as sort of hard techniques like rip wrap and and, uh, and gaming baskets and things like that. Using things like coconut fiber and coconut logs and, and supplemental plantings, things like that. This was about a year later. Um, section of the down. The, Stream section where the trees were, and this is um, this was. Let me go back a couple slides. That was that area, and I keep meaning to go out there and take take some pictures, but I haven't been out there in the last couple of years. But I'm uh, but I'm told that it, it's it has vegetated and we've got a, a good stand, good successional growth of. Um, so it looks much better of any day. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Yes, the stream will be full. You can have some adventure. Yes. So um, that's just an example of how we leverage some of our funds to, to accomplish some of these goals. Okay, this is a project, and one of one of our our friends when I gave this talk a few years ago in a, in a prior in a prior <laughs> life <laughs> uh, was we actually worked on was a, had volunteered. This this goes this project goes back. This is in Hunter County in, in Flemington Borough in Raritan Township. Ben Witherell. Ben Witherell, that's right. Yes. We were trying to remember his name, Ben. I, mean, I, I don't remember the, the W. I don't remember. So Ben Witherell, who, uh, uh, who is our, uh, at DEP, he's the head of our, uh, he's a lead economist for, for our department. And, uh, and he uh, lives up in this area and was involved in, the, in, in this project before he had a life at DEP. But, uh, but anyhow, so um, 
this was a park, and I can't, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the park, but it's right, right off of Route 12 in, in Flemington and Raritan Township, if you're familiar with the area. And uh, you can see, the, you know, pre-construction, uh, what do we have going here? We've got, uh, we've got a lot of stormwater runoff, we've got flashy, flashy flooding type events, we've got no near stream vegetation, um, so it's, it's undermining the banks, um, obviously suspended solids issues and, and all the other stuff that comes along with, with not point source pollution when it's not controlled. So um, this is a pre-construction shot of, of one of the meanders in the park. Obviously post-construction. This was it, uh, about a year later. And then just by chance, this past summer, I was out looking at, at some proposals that had come in our office, and uh, and I went out uh, to visit some sites, and we went to this site, totally by chance, uh, and I said I remember this. So uh, so unfortunately it was in the middle of the drought this summer, so there's not water, but uh, you, but the next slide is that same area uh, about ten years ago. It was about ten. I would say. We're, it's about seven to ten years difference from when this shot was taken to until then. So you can see again establishing uh, uh, repairing vegetation. Uh, of course, it's, of course, it's dry because of the water. But um, but establishing repairing vegetation. Uh, you no, know, obviously it's it's not eroding anymore. Uh, it's been stabilized. Um, you know, really good growth and really good stabilization of the stream core. Um, this is a further downstream. Again, a lot of the same problems here. Uh, high velocities, a lot of uh, you know, erosion on the banks. You know, a little better vegetation. It's not quite mowed down like it was at the, at the other site. Uh, but you know, still, you know, problems with with soil erosion and total suspended solids. Uh, you know, post construction, the, that the winter after post construction. That's what it looked like. Um, this is also a photo from about seven, eight years ago. And um, this is a photo of that same, well, it's the same, I think it took it from the same spot. So, uh, of course, it was during a drought, but, um, but that's what it looked like uh, post-construction about a year afterwards. Uh, and that's what it looks like today. So, again, establish uh, vegetation on the banks, uh, the, the, the channel stabilized, uh, no more ero erosive conditions, um, and this is you know, but from construction to now, we've had Hurricane Irene, Tropical Storm Lee, and Hurricane Sandy have all come through, and it's still and it's still stable. So um, I think that's a testament to the type of projects that we do. There's some more photographs, uh, just a little further upstream from that meander. Again, you know, same, same. Uh, Established vegetation, no erosive things going on there. Okay, we talk about partnering. Uh, this was also at, at this same site. Um, we partnered with the New Jersey Wetlands Mitigation Council. Um, there was a field just off of, of the photographs I just showed you, um, where they had uh, uh, where this was mowed or maybe been, been utilized for uh, grazing. I'm not quite sure. Uh, you can see the. You see the wetland flags here where the delineated wetland is. So they, um, this is probably a swale, so they expanded this out um, and, and planted it. And there's some bulrush in there and there's some other vegetation. Too many cattails for my liking. But, um, but, uh, but you know, really well established, uh, you know, about a year later or two years later, uh, wetland there. Using $319, leveraging it with New Jersey Mitigation Council money. Uh, to get projects like this done. Uh, and this is that same site this summer. So, um, so that's what it looks like today. Uh, that's another shot from a different part. So you can see established vegetation, uh, trees are there, you know, much better con conditions than what, what was there before. Okay. Combined sewers. Um, it's not just storm, <laughs> right? It's a big problem. Uh, this is the city of Camden. Um, 
this is an area known as, and this wasn't one of our 319 projects, but we have a, it, it, at DEP, we, we have a, we, we started a thing a few years ago we called the Camden Collaborative. And the Camden Collaborative was to go into the city of Camden and try and right some of the wrongs environmentally that are going on in Camden. And work with our enforcement folks and work with uh, the local government and work with other state agencies and federal agencies to try and address some of the problems there. So um, this is an area known as uh, Van Nuys Park. About 100 years ago, somebody had the great idea that there was a nice park there with a stream running through it, and they said, hey, let's just pipe the stream and fill in over top of it and build some ball fields. And that was, that was going to be wonderful. So that's what they did. So, um, and then the city of Camden grew uh, and they, with the combined sewers, and this, this um, the neighborhood around Van Ida Park, um, this, and I had, I had been there in, in the, before they did the restoration work. Um, and in less than a one-year storm, this is what happens. Like this is this isn't Hurricane Sandy. This is this was you know an average summer gully washer. So um, and this was the, the folks in the, in this area had to put up with um, all the time. And, and again, it's combined sewers, so it's not you know it's not just stormwater. So um, so really really um, awful um, condition. So so we were trying to try and address issues like that. We used 319 dollars to come into the city of Camden and partner with a really great partner down there named Andy Cricken. He is the executive director of the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority. A really great guy who's very active in the community. Um, uh, you would not think of an MUA director as being somebody that um, would, would uh, be interested in uh, quality of life type stuff uh, in the local community, but he, he really is really great. He works with a lot of nonprofits. He works with a lot of religious organizations in town. Um, and this, you know, he, kind of, he was kind of the, working with him and Frank McLaughlin from our uh, Office of Brown Barrels Reuse. We've done some really, really great projects. And with a little bit of 319 money, we've been able to help out the folks there. So, so and I'll talk about this a little bit later. So, uh, so we used some 319 dollars as part of our Camden Collaborative. And we've expanded the Camden Collaborative to not only Camden, but we're working in the cities of Perth Amboy and in uh, Newark. We've also expanded this, this work up into the city of Patterson as well. So um, doing a lot of these similar type things. So um, this, is, this slide's a little dated, but over the next slide's a little dated. But, uh, so we've partnered with Rutgers University, uh, DEP, uh, and the Camden County MUA uh, to do uh, a series of rain guards to the city. Um, not this site, but there was another site nearby. This was actually the first, one of the first ones. Uh, Again, leveraging, leveraging resources to get things done. Uh, there was uh, about a block away from here, two blocks away from here, uh, there was an abandoned gas station. Underground tanks, remediation needed to be done, just had been sitting there for like forever. Um, so as part of this effort and working with our partners and our partners within DEP and outside of DEP and in the community, uh, we were able to get some brownfield restoration money to dig up that, uh, to remediate that old gas station. The town took it over. They built a large rain garden there and a park. So right now that area is, instead of being an abandoned brownfield site, it's now a cleaned up brownfield site and it, it's providing a water quality benefit. But this is one of the projects uh, of the 12 or 15 projects that we did with that grant. Um, this is actually right outside of the MUA, so it's taken from the, from the offices of the MUA. So this is a neighborhood across the street. Uh, but uh, what we did is we went in with we're using $319 and leveraging with other community groups and, and, and other funding sources, and we went in and we built a series of, now I have 12 on this slide, but we've done way more than 12. We're probably in the 20s or 30s at this point. And building you know, just little uh, catchments and rain gardens and bioretention basins throughout the city to alleviate the stormwater impact and to stop the stormwater from getting into the combined sewers. So, um, you know, it's just been just a little bit of effort, a little bit of education, working with some partners, you can do some really great things. Okay, again, I, I apologize for all the Camden County stuff, but um, this is, uh, when I talked earlier about writing some of the wrongs in my earlier life at DEP, this is a good example. Uh, but I guess back, if you go back, like right after World War II up until the 1970s, um, you had this explosion of suburbia in the United States. 
and um, the way, you know, the Levittown, you see Levittown on Long Island, there's Levittown, Pennsylvania, there's Willingboro in New Jersey, which is also Levittown, um, down near where I live. Um, you know, they built these, these large-scale uh, communities with, uh, you know, half-acre, quarter-acre lots, most of quarter-acre lots with, like, branch houses and stuff like that. And the way they dealt with stormwater is they just got it into a pipe as quick as they could, and they got it out to the stream as fast as they could. And then, then you know, around the, the late 70s, early 80s, mid-80s, uh, they figured out that why are we having all these splash floods and these flooding streams? Well, it's because we take all the stormwater and we just send it off as, off as quick as we can. So, um, so the goal then was to build in these detention basins um, to deal with those flooding conditions. Um, and there, they didn't give a hoot about water quality. They were, um, they were interested in just attenuating the flow. That's, that's what that was all about. So, um, and that's when I started permitting some of these things. So, so this is a typical, uh, typical 80s, early 90s era uh, detention basin. Uh, in, in, inlet, outlet, or outlet, inlet, whatever. Um, this is probably two inlets and then one outlet. Um, concrete low flow channel because at the time they didn't care about water quality. The one year storm, they just wanted to get it through and get it out in you know, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and then if, if they got you know, anything more heavy or, or, more, or greater than that, then this just acted as a giant bathtub to hold the water and slowly drain it off as time went by. So, um, so New Jersey is filled with, well, with a lot of these things that really don't really address water quality. Um, they just deal with um, you know, trying to attenuate flow in the, in the, you know, the bigger storms. So, uh, so this is a, a really good partner, uh, the Camden, Craig McGee at the Camden County uh, Soil Conservation District uh, did a lot of these projects uh, in the Cooper River watershed. So what they did is they came back in and they retrofitted some of these basins. Um, where they uh, you know put in some kind of some flow control structures uh, with a with a you know a three inch orifice, but not in such a way that it could clog up if, you know if there was a you know really a big storm. Um, and this is I know they were doing some monitoring too as part of that effort, um, and then retrofitting the basin, which is pretty you know pretty cheap. And there's a lot of you know a lot of these basins, you know just simply going in and putting in you know some large um, riprap or rock structures and putting in a couple of check dams just to divert the flow out in a way as long as you've got you know a stable vegetation there um, so that you know, just to, to increase your contact time can really do a lot to, to, to minimize um, you know what's getting into the you know into the stream how you know when it comes out of the basin so I uh, did a lot of stuff like that throughout Camden County uh, throughout the Cooper River watershed and some of our probably with our next round of 303D listings, um, a lot of those streams were prepared for TSS, and a lot of them are starting to come off. And I think it's a lot of, just because of the simple projects like this. Um, we're seeing a lot of success with, with these kind of projects. So, um, so that's what they did, and brought in some uh, you know, flow control structures and things like that. Uh, and that's what the basin looked like you know, a year later. You know, it's vegetated, you're increasing your contact time, uh, the vegetation is there to, you know, to, to not only slow down the velocity, but also to uptake some of the pollutants in, in, in certain cases. Um, and it's really beneficial stuff. Okay. So, this, uh, just to, you know, so in cases like the one that you just showed us, right. like who is responsible for monitoring on a long-term basis? Well, we do, um, we try and write some monitoring it, it's hit and miss. Um, we, my, the, I work in the Division of Water Monitoring and Standards, and we're, we're, we're um, now three bureaus. We have our Bureau of Marine Water Monitoring, we have our Bureau of uh, Freshwater Biological Monitoring, and then the group I work for, which is the Bureau of Environmental Analysis, Restoration, and Standards. So what we do, uh, bears, so low acronyms in government, but so, um, so we do, we, we take the information that we get from our monitoring groups, and we analyze that. I don't do it, but folks I work with, they analyze that information, uh, and they're responsible for putting that together uh, and submitting the 303 D list. And, well, now it's, it's called the integrated report because there's a narrative section of it that's through. 
I'm getting too techy, but there's the 305B report and the 303D list, which together we call the integrated report, which we submit to EPA every two years. So um, think of it as uh, as going to the doctor. Uh, you know, you go to the doctor and uh, check. You go for a physical and they check you out, and they say, okay, well, you know, that's the 305B report, the narrative. Hey, how do you look? You know, we do some tests. You know, you, you know. You, that kind of stuff, and then the 303D is going to like the lab results. So, that, so together, the, we call them the integrator report, and that's that's really how we report out to EPA what we're doing. So, um, but some of my grants, I mean, we do some effectiveness monitoring. Um, it's but we just don't have a lot of money. So, I mean, so usually we get the samples and. You know, TSS and phosphorus that kind of stuff, but um, but we're talking about and we're retooling the program and my my grant program uh, and and really trying to think of other ways that we could do some more long term effectiveness monitoring for some of these some of these types of yeah. projects. You know, for example, if there is community buy, you can have a local school district you can use that. Yeah. The space is a field lab, you know, and yes. keep on doing that year after year. Yes. Yeah, and we do some of that. Um, there's a program that we fund, which is a, it's a project WET um, that comes out of my office. Um, sometimes it's 319, sometimes it's not. That goes off. Oh, <laughs> I, just, I just saw it disappear. So, um, so with, with Project WET, which is Project Water Education for Teachers, that's what WET stands for. So, um, so, and, and we, we, we do this through Rutgers University, an employee for Rutgers, a fellow by the name of Kevin Ka, who goes out and works with teachers and does those type of things. And sometimes he goes back to, you know, I'm not directly involved with that, but that's some of the funding, we do some of that. But, you know, like, again, it's just, it's limited funding, but, um, but those are the types of things that we do encourage, you know, and, and when we're doing projects like this, and maybe a little bit of monitoring, and maybe working with the stakeholders in the community, uh, and whether it's schools or nonprofits or other organizations, uh, local watershed groups, if they, you know, if there are any of that are around, um, to do this type of thing. And, and, and education, you know, a lot of it is education. Right? Right. A lot of folks, you know, don't really even think. You know, we think about this because it's what we do, but other people don't think about this kind of stuff. Okay, this is um, this is a project that I worked on. I'm still working on, um, but I've been involved with for a couple of years now. Again, back into Camden. I apologize for all the Camden stuff, but um, this is uh, the uh, Cramer Hill section of Camden. Um, this area here is the Harrison Avenue landfill. It was from like the 1950s to the early 1970s, uh, it was the municipal landfill for the city of Camden. Uh, nothing really bad there, just, you know, just trash. Um, and uh, it was never, you know, it was, back then they didn't like they were clay liners, they just, you know, just dump stuff there. So, um, so they walk away from it in the mid-70s. Uh, it's overgrown with, well, it was overgrown with vegetation. Um, uh, this area out here is Petty's Island. City of Philadelphia is over here. Camden's over here. Petty's Island, I don't know if you follow the follow South Jersey politics, but um, there's uh, there was an interest in developing Petty's Island uh, back a few years ago uh, as like a redevelopment project. Sitco, I don't know, I think they left, but uh, Sitco had a refine uh, had a uh, facility out here, uh, not a refinery, but they had some tanks out there. Um, eventually, it came under the control, I believe, of the Nature Conservancy, and it's going to become a nature preserve eventually. And it's in the process of doing that now. Um, funny story, back in my early days of permitting, one of the good things I thought I did, um, down, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with the uh, Adventure Aquarium in Camden, it's down the river about a mile or two. Next to the Adventure Aquarium, there's a... Uh, the Susquehanna Bank Center, which is an outdoor, indoor concert venue. Uh, and then next to that is where the Battleship New Jersey is located. And then next to that is the South Jersey Port Corporation. So back in the early 90s, when I was, uh, was a, a young permit writer in land use program, 
I went, uh, one of my projects was the, the port there was going to expand their, was expanding their berth, expanding their dock, and they had to do a lot of dredging, and uh, they were taking a lot of intertidal subtidal shallows, and I said, I want mitigation for that, you know, and they said, okay, we'll give you mitigation. So they came up here, and they dug out this area here, and this was the mitigation site for the project that I worked on. And they made a you know, tidal mud flat there, and it was so successful that there's an eagle's nest there now. <laughs> so, which is great, but then when you're trying to do stuff down here, that's a problem because this this yellow line here is the eagle foraging habitat, the zone, the buffer zone for the you know for the perching habitat for the eagles, the nesting pair of all the eagles down here. So, um, so just a funny story. But um, so anyhow, so so this project, this was an opportunity. Uh, to do some kind of brownfield remediation uh, and to do some environmental justice type work and to work with a whole different set of partners to do some neat things. So, um, all right, so this is the Harrison Avenue landfill. It's the largest open space in the city of Camden. This is the Cooper River, which drains most of South Jersey and Camden County. And then here's the back channel around Patty's Island, the Delaware River, and then where I'm standing would be Philadelphia. Yeah, there's, there's the information about the landfill. It, they, they basically just walked away from it. Um, uh, not only are there eagles there, um, there are freshwater mussels there, fairly decent population of freshwater mussels, and there's an adjunct fish there too that you go up and go up the Cooper River and also go up around Petty's Island. Um, very beautiful neighborhood. All right, so what happened was. Um, Uh, McDonald's, the, the restaurant chain McDonald's, was originally owned by uh, a man named Ray Kroc. And Ray Kroc um, and his wife Joan started a foundation. And of course, you know, they owned McDonald's, they, you know, they made a lot of money. So, um, uh, so part of their foundation was to go into uh, distressed communities. Uh, and build community centers and partnered with the Salvation Army. So, uh, Croc died years ago, and I don't know if Mrs. This, this Croc is still alive, but, but anyhow. So, um, so they, um, they have these Croc centers, which are, are sal run by the Salvation Army uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of urban areas. Uh, Philadelphia has one, there's one in Detroit, and there's, now there's one in Canada. So, um, so they were looking to, you know, they needed a big piece of land uh, to build these, this giant community center, um, so they looked at this site. So this was an opportunity to not only leverage you know, private dollars, foundation dollars, but also to use um, some innovative techniques for the state uh, in, you know, in an EJ community, use some of those money from the state and federal government, and, to, and, to, and eventually use 319 dollars as, as well. So, um, so our, our folks on the, on, the, on the dirty side of DEP, <laughs> they, uh, uh, they came in. Uh, not only did they uh, uh, remediate the, the landfill, uh, but they also um, they were able to use uh, beneficial. Well, that's another slide. But you know, they 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 yeah, they used local dredge material from the Delaware River that was clean to cap the site when they were done doing the remediation. So um, more on the Croc Center. So this is you know, the work they were doing to for the you know to, to build the Croc Center. Um, Again, typical using no benef beneficial reuse would cost more. Using less, you know, using these techniques uh, is cheaper. Some of these slides are a little weird. So, so anyhow, so this is the, so once they did all that work, um, they started building the Croc Center. It's a hundred million dollar facility. Um, you know, twenty five million in remediation, which secures a hundred million in, in foundation money for the Croc Center. Um, it serves three counties in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. Um, in its training and job placement, it's got a community center, it's got two Olympic-sized pools, there's a movie theater there, and it creates 160, you know, full-time jobs in the city of Camden. Question. When the landfill was abandoned, was all the trash just left there, or did they remove it, or did you have to remove it? Well, they just, they left it there, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but, um, but no, they, it's still there. I mean, I, I, they, you know, it, it was municipal waste, it wasn't, you know, anything. Hazardous. I think there were some hot spots that they found that they had to 
haul stuff away. But, uh, but for the most part, they left they left the you know left it in place and used the dredge material to cap it, to cap it properly. So um, of course they left the, you know they left the eagle habitat, foraging habitat, and then back there. Um, Structured wetlands, fire retention basins, and then floating shore. So, so while this was going on, I was involved. One of my, we talked about my history at DEP. One of my, and I'm still technically still am. I was one of our environmental justice um, liaisons for the department. And this was, uh, this was really a highlight because you know the community is a distressed community, um, but it's also. Uh, because of the environmental issues, and plus, you know, I talked earlier about our TMA collaborative initiative, which is expanding statewide now. Um, this just got a lot of attention, uh, and we did some tours of, of, of Camden, this facility, and some other facilities, and we had folks come down from uh, some folks from uh, headquarters of EPA and folks from Region Two across the river here came down, and uh, I get a phone call uh, a couple of weeks later. Uh, well, then the Croc Center opened in October 2014, and there's our commissioner. Uh, Bob Martin and Congressman Norcross and Dana Red, who's the uh, mayor of Camden, and I don't know his name, but he's a freeholder. And that's the fellow from the Salvation Army who runs the center. So it's really, really, you know, huge facility, you know, right in, right, you know, along the waterfront. Uh, uh, really, really a great, really good thing. So, so I get a call a couple weeks later, maybe a couple months later, after we tour the facility. From my friends up at EPA, and they said, "Wow, we really like you know the we really like when we toured the site, and we're really interested in what you talked about because you know, we talked about you know what are we going to do out here with you know we'd like to do some work out here, but there's just not a lot of money, and we talked about maybe doing a living shoreline, and they said, look, we're gonna we're gonna give you some money um, to design a living shoreline for this for this one. So we got three hundred twenty-three thousand dollars in discretionary money from EPA." Um, to uh, do some investigation and design a living shoreline. Not to build it, because that's going to cost a lot more money, but at least to uh, do all the legwork up to the permitting process to get this, to do a living shoreline. So, so what's a living shoreline? A living shoreline is what it sounds like. You know, Typically in the past, you've, you know, somebody wanted to, to uh, uh, either they would dump riprap or they would do some kind of gabion basket or some kind of wall seawall or uh, you know or bulkhead of some sort and then you would have you know basically you would have a dead zone you might have some uh, a little bit of uh, intertidal you know, stuff going on here but for the most part uh, you know blocking the upland from the, from the water's edge uh, living shore lines want to create that gentle slope have more room for not only for water quality but also and for protection but also uh, more habitat for for the biota in the, in the area Ten minutes, to Ten minutes. Okay. All right. well, I can do. It. I can do it. So, um, so uh, okay. So, living shoreline. You know, this is you know, it's like some of the other slides I showed earlier. Um, you know, in, in, a, in a freshwater environment, you have this in a in a saltwater or a brackish environment. Uh, you bring in these living shorelines, and usually using coconut fiber logs uh, with some supplemental plantings. Uh, some some uh, use maybe shell bags. Uh, for, as you know, for, for protection, there's a lot of different techniques. This is a project because uh, I also work with the Delaware Estuary Program down on Morris River in Cumberland County. Uh, this was these, these pictures are pre Hurricane Sandy, so um, there's a the oyster industry is pretty big in the, in the Delaware Bay, and uh, they come and this is the docks where they bring the oysters in and they process them. So, um, so again, you know, hard stabilization here, uh, you know, riprap. They came in and put a line. To, you know, Daniel Krieger is a doctor. Dr. Daniel Krieger, who's the science director of the Delaware Engineering Program, is really big on uh, living shorelines. She uh, designed this you know, coconut fiber logs staked in place. This was only, I don't know if the dates are on here, but uh, we were talking about this slide the other day. From here to here to here was, well, from here to here, um, was the span of only a couple of months. So that's how much uh, filled in uh, behind the, the coconut logs 
uh, you know, vegetation, you know, they had to come back and replant a little bit, but uh, for the most part, they, they held uh, and, and trapped sediment and created, uh, you, know, kind of, uh, you know, a living shoreline there. And then this was a year later. Um, but this was pre-Sandy. Hurricane Sandy came through. Everybody's familiar with what happened, you know, on the New Jersey coast. Delaware Bay got hit really hard, too. Um, a lot of communities were really hit hard. Um, you know, not as populated, obviously, but, um, but this survived. <laughs> this is still there. All those bulkheads, they're gone. But the living shoreline stayed. So, so uh, these techniques are, you know, and, 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 and Dr. Krieger tells the story about how, um, you know, they're kind of laughing at him when they put this in. And then after they came back after Sandy, they said, can you put one of, one of those over here? So um, they, they, they work very well. And, you know, they, they're just really good. So I'll put the, this is, these are, I think this is the uh, state of Maryland, really where these got started. There's, you know, a couple different adaptations to that, you know, depending on uh, wave action and, and tidal issues and things like that. So, um, but they're, they're all usually pretty good. Um, you know, again, this kind of stuff, you know, when you have uh, with uh, uh, climate change and, uh, you know, issues along with that, and we're losing, and I know in the Delaware Bay, we're losing about an acre, about an acre a month, acre a month um, in the Delaware Bay of, of, of tidal saltwater marsh. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty significant. So, um, and the, this, this is a way to use na nature to help you know, protect those those areas. So okay, so so um, these living shorelines have been used in, in um, sailing waters and uh, for years. We're trying now to design one for uh, freshwater brackish. Well, it's not brackish. It's freshwater up in Camden uh, to see if we can. And this is outward of the uh, out of the outward of the landfill. So uh, this is what this is what it looks like. Um, they did pour some riprap on that the edge. Um, and uh, there is some tidal flats there with some, some aquatic vegetation. Uh, um, th these are two of my cohorts at DEP. This is Frank McLaughlin, who's the head of the Camden Collaborative. Uh, this guy's name is Dave Bean. He's our, um, he's head of our natural resources damages group. Not even, he's one of our, our folks. And these are the freshwater mussels. There's a really huge population at the mouth of the Cooper River uh, and, and the back channel behind Patty's Island of freshwater mussels. So we're trying to incorporate uh, freshwater mussels, the native freshwater mussels there, into the design of this living shore. So, um, and that's that's me, by the way. But so <laughs> that's what it looks like at low tide. That's Josh Moody from the Partnership for the Dell Restaurant. So, so we're working on a design with the grant that I told you about, um, informational mussels in the Delaware River Basin. Uh, you know, nature's filters. Uh, this is from Virginia Tech. Techniques at Virginia Tech, um, type with no muscles, tank with eight muscles in it. You know, a few minutes later, that's what the tank with no muscles looks like. That's what the tank with muscles looks like. So, you know, there's a wall. Of, you know, so you're using, you know, actual biota to, to help with water quality. Uh, and Dr. Krieger had written up in the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, and then actually that story went nationwide about her work with the freshwater muscles in the Delaware. Um, okay, so. Um, so the concept is that we're going to put a living shoreline out here, or at least design it with the money that we got from EPA, and, and incorporate that into the Croc Center, and use some other funds to, you know, create a park, Croc Center, uh, do some environmental benefit, you know, all around good stuff. So, okay, so uh, we put out a request for proposals every year. We're a little late this year. There's a lot of reasons for that, but we're a little late for this year. So. We, Probably available in early 2018. Uh, we put out an RFP. We, it looks like um, for for projects, um, likely due proposal due likely in March, maybe early April 2017. Um, that's the website. <laughs> that's our current website. So you can go. The information will be posted there. Um, we'll have a little more money this year. We'll have 2.6 million, not 2.5 million. Um, uh, again, priorities will be we work around the state. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been Barnegat Bay, and Atlantic Coastal, and Raritan River Basin. Now we're shifting that slightly, so it will likely be uh, the Raritan and the Lower Delaware as we move around the state, the five water regions. Uh, you know, you know, projects in, in those in those two areas. 
Uh, again, CSO abatement type projects and stuff I talked about here, uh, and then Living Shore Lines as well. Uh, last year we expanded the RFP to Coastal Lakes. I don't know if we're going to have Coastal Lakes in there again, but uh, maybe that will be one time thing. We'll see when the RFP comes out. That's who I am. Um, some, some exciting stuff, and I talked to the dudes about this. Uh, we have, uh, we're looking to expand uh, the, our financial resources to enhance the 319 type work we do and restoration work. Um, so as part of this RFP, and that's why it's been a little delayed, we're, we're looking at bringing in additional funding sources, um, <coughs> focusing, again, probably on coastal areas like Barnegat Bay, and, and from what I'm told, on CSO communities, too. And doing things like basin retrofits in the Barnegat Bay watershed, or doing green infrastructure type projects in the CSO communities. Um, and hopefully a lot more money than the two and a half million dollars that I have to give out. So, okay. Thank you.